Good morning, everybody. My name is Connor Flanagan. I'm Director of Education here at the Southampton History Museum. And this morning, we're joined by my coworker, Mary Cummings. Uh, she is our uh, Research Center Manager, uh, also our archivist and sort of chief internal historian of all things Southampton. Whenever I have a question or if someone comes with a phone call that I don't really have no idea, pass it to Mary. If she doesn't know, I don't know who would. Um, but, but yeah, so I will pass it on to her. She will continue on this series of High Style and Guild Today's talks. And at the end of this, if you have any questions, I'll pop back in to ask them to Mary for you. Make sure to submit them in the Q&A function or the chat bar at the bottom. Without further ado, enjoy everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining me uh, once again for my talk on Jesse Woolworth Donahue, the Striver. In the sad saga of Jesse Woolworth Donahue's life, there is dramatic proof that riches do not buy happiness and love does not conquer all. Born rich in 1886, the youngest of F.W. Woolworth's three daughters, Jessie, along with her older sisters, Helena and Edna, is indulged by her father, whose five and dime empire has made him among the richest men in the nation. Born dirt poor himself, Frank is more than ready to live the life of a capitalist plutocrat. And there he is. Not so his wife, Jenny, whom he married in 1876 and who has been known to admit that she misses the early days when there was less money and she saw more of Frank. Frank pays millions in 1898 for the family five-story French Gothic Chateau at Fifth Avenue and 80th, 80th Street designed by the celebrated architect Cass Gilbert. Whenever he returns to the ornate mansion from one of his buying trips, he showers his girls with wonderful gifts. Nothing is too good for his daughters, uh, for whom he has high hopes that they will marry well, even setting his sights on European royalty. In this respect, uh, Jesse will disappoint, but she is the daughter who will have a significant role in the F.W. Woolworth empire, sitting on the board and watching over the family finances. With his fortune ballooning in 1898, Woolworth buys Winfield Hall, a magnificent summer home in Glen Cove, where Jessie accustoms herself to luxurious country living. The three-story mansion looks out on Long Island Sound, and it boasts all the amenities of her city home, plus a golf course, a magnificent rose garden, a greenhouse, and more. When it burns down, Frank rebuilds it better in 1916. In those early years of the new century, Jessie matures into a very entitled young woman. According to the family biography, she attends the finest girls' schools in the East and often appears in public attired like a regal princess, dressed in her stunning fashions and opulent jewelry, wrapped in sable coats and chauffeured about town in her own Rolls Royce. After Helena Woolworth marries a former district attorney in 1904, and Edna marries Franklin Laws Hutton, a partner in the banking firm E.F. Hutton in 1907, only Jessie remains to fulfill her father's dreams of a royal son-in-law. But when the 27-year-old Jessie meets a handsome young Irish-American charmer at a, at a New York City skating rink, those hopes are dashed. Jessie falls hard for James Donahue's playboy glamour, so different from the dullards she thinks her sisters have chosen. 
Though James has all the manners of a gentleman and does in fact have a rich family, his social standing is nowhere near what Frank Woolworth is prepared to accept for his daughter. James is one of 11 children of Patrick Donahue, whose fortune derives from a fat rendering factory at the foot of West 39th Street. His low social rank and the smelly source of the family wealth have Frank Woolworth pleading with Jesse not to marry him, but to no avail. On February 1st, 1912, the day that Jesse and James are pronounced man and wife by the prestigious Scrotton headmaster Endicott Peabody in the Woolworth's Fifth Avenue mansion, Jesse's father spends the morning in his, on his office couch weeping uncontrollably. When the hour arrives, he gives the bride away with a heavy heart. Jesse, dressed in a white satin gown with a uh, train and a bouquet of lilies of the valley, uh, and she wears the groom's wedding present, uh, a diamond and sapphire brooch, which was bought with her money. Jesse gives James a wedding present of $5 million. Her forgiving father gives the couple a townhouse near his own, which he has also done for her sisters, so that the Woolworth daughters monopolize the Fifth Avenue neighborhood. By all accounts, Jessie is a rather cold, hands-off mother to her two sons, Woolworth, mercifully called Wooly, born in 1913, and James Jr., known as Jimmy, in 1915. For the first 10 years of their marriage, the Donahues spend much of their time traveling abroad, relying on governesses to take care of the children. Jessie seems to regard her children as decorative adjuncts, along with her jewels, her houses, her Rolls Royces, and her private railroad carriage. She's known to favor Jimmy, a child of uh, exceptional beauty. The massive fortune and lavish lifestyle acquired by the rags to which is Frank do not protect him from heartache. When Jesse's sister, Edna Hutton, aged 33, commits suicide in May 1917 by swallowing a vial of strychnine crystals, her six-year-old daughter, Barbara, is the one who discovers the body. Her devastated grandfather, Frank, steps in for Barbara, for, for Barbara's philandering father, going, giving Barbara a nice home at Winfield and acting as her fond protector. Barbara and her cousin, Jimmy, have always uh, have been kindred souls with a wild streak, and their bond is strengthened when Barbara is so often with her cousins after her mother's death. Then on June 7, 1918, Frank feels he must petition the courts to declare his wife, Jenny, incompetent due to what her, do her doctors term pre a pre-senile condition. Toward the end of 1918, Frank Woolworth's own health begins to fail. And at his death in 1919, Barbara loses a beloved grandfather, but she will inherit doubly from Hutton wealth, as well as from her mother's share of the Woolworth fortune. As adults, Barbara and cousin Jimmy will always have the wherewithal to lead reckless lives. Hitting cafe societies, wild international haunts, drinking, dancing, and pursuing men. Beautiful men are Jimmy's obvious preference, 
And in Barbara's case, the pursuit leads to an astonishing seven marriages. Among the, her bridegrooms are a count, a baron, a prince, and Cary Grant, whose wedding in the notorious to the notorious poor little rich girl is mocked as cash and carry. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jessie's marriage to James is proving as troubled as her father had predicted. After a two month bridal trip, the restless James had resumed his playboy ways gambling, drinking, and cruising cafe, cafe society hotspots for more seductive companions than his wife, who has lost the youthful elan that had briefly attracted him on the roller rink. Jesse is aging into a rather graceless man matron. Rather than admit that her father was right to oppose her marriage to James, Jessie decides to use her enormous wealth as a counterforce uh, against his disgraceful behavior, an effort that backfires when her, con when her con ostentatious spending leads to criticism and social snubs. Jessie's two sons, with childhood behind them, add to her troubles. Wooly less so than Jimmy, though there are raised eyebrows over Wooly's womanizing, his lavish and costly African safari that lasts a year and involves more than 30 elephants, and his acquisition of a private hunting lodge known as Riverhead, which he fills with his trophies. Located on Long Island in Manorville, it later becomes a Riverhead Town Rod and Gun Club. Still, it is the favored Jimmy who causes Jesse the most worry as he's asked to leave one school after another in the 20s and early 30s. His refusal to abide by any restrictions whatsoever leads to his expulsion from the Harvey School, the Hun School, and eventually from Chope. Among his many transgressions, there is an unauthorized escape to New York City on a whim to take dance lessons from the sensational black dancer, Mr. Bojangles. Jessie is also struggling to set some limits on her husband's gambling. As his losses mount, she tries mightily to enforce nightly limits, but without success. And his constant need for more money seems to have been behind a very bizarre episode. On October 1st, 1925, Jessie's preparing for a formal evening out in New York City when she discovers that her jewel drawer has been emptied of nearly $700,000 worth of jewelry, worth more than $6 million in today's money. The New York Times describes it as the greatest jewelry robbery in the history of the city. And the Brooklyn Eagle reports that a distraught Jessie has gone into seclusion. For several years afterward, the sensational Donahue jewel heist continues to fascinate the press as a long tangled investigation repeatedly fails to nail the cul culprit. Long afterward, it is James' son, Wooly, who reveals what many have always suspected. It was his father, James Sr who had stolen the jewels in his desperate effort to put a dent in his debts without having to ask Jesse to cover them. In 1920, eager to enter the social swim in Southampton 
and also, no doubt, to keep the marital fires burning by offering James another magnificent residence to show off, Jessie uses her fortune to buy a huge 25-room Tudor-style mansion on 16 oceanfront acres in Southampton. She immediately begins remodeling the mansion, which she calls Wilden Manor, and furnishing it in the most extravagant fashion. Husband James is particularly thrilled by the separate beach house with its lounges, bar, dressing rooms, and indoor swimming pools. By 1927, Jessie has spent $3 million on the summer residence, but failed to crack the elite beach club next door. Rumors circulate that the reason given for the club's snub was that Jesse's vast inheritance was from a member of the scorned merchant class. One wonders if they knew about the fat rendering factory. Possibly it was just easier to fall back on class snobbery than to go into James's reputation for depraved carousing. Disappointed by the beach club rejection and beginning to realize that the extravagance is not impressing Southampton society, Jessie looks toward Florida as a better place to make her social mark. In 1927, she conceives a magnificent Palm Beach fantasy palace, which she will call Cielito Lindo, a bit of heaven, and which will rival the fabulous Mar-a-Lago in Mediterranean-style splendor. For her, with her eyes on the 1928 Palm Beach social season, she rides herd on building crews to work with record speed on the 100-plus room residence and its grounds that will boast formal gardens, a tea pavilion, orange groves, tennis courts, and a three-story tower. Designed for royal scale entertaining, Cielito Lindo formally opens on April 20th, 1928, with a proud Jesse presiding over one of the largest private affairs of the season at her new estate. It is declared one of the five largest and most notable homes ever built in Palm Beach. And to build this bit of paradise had taken less than a year. Jessie's able to revel briefly in the success of her party, putting aside her son Jimmy's refusal to integrate into the boarding school elite, as she had hoped, and deluding herself that the magnificent Cielito Lindo will amuse her wayward husband and keep him close. He seems happy at first in Palm Beach, where he can pass for old wealth, a world away from the fat rendering factory. But it is not in his nature to settle for a life without risk and excitement. Deprived of such stimulants, he is subject to bouts of depression. In Palm Beach, he finds one outlet in the gambling rooms of Colonel Bradley's Beach Club, where his losses are staggering. While Jessie fights to control the outflow, she abandons the fight to control Jimmy's education. After Cho, there will be no more formal schooling for Jimmy, who's free to follow in the footsteps of his undisciplined father. On April 13, 1931, on her return from Palm Beach, Jessie Donahue is admitted to the private Harbor Sanatorium at 667 Madison Avenue, suffering from a nervous breakdown. The extent to which her husband's massive debts and depressed, depressed state have driven her over the brink is not known. But that same week, James Sr. draws up a new will. The following week, he invites two friends to join him and both his sons for lunch at 6 East 80th Street. 
Excusing himself from a card game after the meal, he takes six tablets of bichloride of mercury from the medicine cabinet and staggers back to his guests violently ill. It's an act of virtual self-destruction following years of alcohol and drug abuse. The efforts of his sons to save him are futile and he's taken to the Harbor Sanatorium where Jesse is wheeled in from another ward to witness her husband's death. Jesse rallies after James's death. He has plundered her fortune prompting her to make a few gestures at scaling down, though she remains a fabulously wealthy woman. She now shares a massive Fifth, Ave Fifth Avenue duplex with her son, Jimmy, who lives large and dangerously. He's in his element in all of the bastions of excess and indulgence favored by cafe society, often accompanied by his cousin, Barbara. When the US joins the fight in World War II, Jimmy is drafted into the army, from which he is eventually dishonorably discharged after making suggestive comments to an officer at Fort Dix. Jesse will always welcome him back, but he will always bring trouble. She no longer has any interest in Walden Manor, her show place in Southampton, which is sold in auction in 1937 for $137,000. It survives the 1938 hurricane, but in 1941, when gardeners and butlers are all off to war and belts are tightened, she, the residence is raised, leaving only James Donahue's much loved pool house. When the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, refugees from wartime Europe, arrive in Palm Beach in April 1941 with plans to visit the opulent Silito Lindo, Jesse is thrilled to host the famous Quasi Royals. The Duke takes a shine to Woolly, and the Duchess, restless and bored, is captivated by Jimmy's jokes and uninhibited behavior. Soon she is relying on him to cheer up the gloomy Duke. And then their relationship takes a scandalous turn. Society is amused and shocked when Jimmy, who is 34, and the 54-year-old Duchess of Windsor form a bizarre love triangle with the Duke. It may be a scandal, but no one is more thrilled than Jesse who shamelessly puts a nice chunk of her fortune at the Windsor's disposal. There are jewels for the Duchess and lavish entertainments and excursions for the trio, which is a foursome when Jesse joins along. A close personal tie to the Windsors is a social coup of the first order. After four years and three months of each other's company, the Windsors and Jimmy are beginning to tire of each other. And when it is reported that Jimmy kicked the Duchess in the shin over a trivial matter, drawing blood, the affair ends abruptly and completely. Jimmy and his mother pick up where they left off. He to provide scandalous grist for the gossip mill, and Jesse to struggle, struggle to reclaim the social spotlight without the Windsors. She summers in Newport beginning in 1945, but sells her house there. And in 1956, she buys the manor house known as Claverack in Southampton. Built in 1892 on Halsey Neck Lane for Brigadier General Thomas H. Barber, it was modeled on the 1764 Van Rensselaer Manor House on the Hudson. It's her last mansion, and to furnish its 30 rooms with the contents of 100 rooms now in storage requires some hard choices. On 
On September 23rd, 1966, Jimmy is found dead in his bed at 834 Fifth Avenue. He has died after yet another night of too much alcohol and too much seconal, and it falls on Wooly's wife, Mary, to break the news to Jesse that her favorite, favorite son is dead. This is the worst thing that can happen to me, is Jesse's quiet reply. 27 limousines follow Jimmy's coffin from the funeral mass to Woodland Cemetery. At the front of the cortege are leading members of New York High Society, Astors and Vanderbilts, paying tribute to vast wealth. Toward the back are his friends and lovers who knew a different Jimmy. Five years later in 1971, when Jesse dies at the age of 84, she will join Jimmy in the fanciful Woolworth family mausoleum in Woodlawn Cemetery, designed by John Russell Pope. When her will is opened, it demonstrates her mastery over at least one aspect of her life, her personal and financial assets. There are no blanket bequests. Instead, there is a strong, long list of very specific and carefully chosen bequests, disposing of her vast fortune and her many possessions down to a single diamond brooch for her son, Willie's wife. And there, uh, we conclude uh, the tale of Jesse Woolworth Donahue. That was great, Mary. Um, once again, we're met with the end of one of these Zoom lectures. That feels a little awkward because you'd always expect that polite clap. Um, I should figure out a uh, like a sound cue to have the claps come in. Um, but uh, hopefully everybody enjoyed this talk today. Um, and if you do have any questions, now would be the time to submit them. Um, again, you can put those in the Q&A function or the chat bar. Uh, see, we have someone in the chat bar putting in a bunch of clapping hands emojis. So that's oh, great. Oh, good. <laughs> that works out. Um, Thank you. Let's see. Uh, oh, we have uh, from, from Penny at the, at the library, or formerly at the library. Again, congratulations to Penny on uh, retiring. Um, but uh, she said, great talk, Mary. Kind of makes me glad I'm not rich. <laughs> doesn't buy happiness. Yeah, it doesn't always. Uh, that's the one thing I could think about uh, during this talk. Uh, more poignantly than I think probably all the other ones is just how somewhat depressing this one is uh, in relation. But let's see. Uh, we have somebody asking, are there any of the mansions still standing in Southampton? Claberac, which was also known as King Waden uh, and was once a show house uh, about 10 years ago, uh, that is still on Halsey Neck Lane. And the pool house uh, has been, you know, on the ocean has been turned into a private residence. And what's, is the first one also a private residence still or? Uh, that was raised, yeah. The one okay. on the ocean, yeah. They couldn't pay the taxes. <laughs> anyway, gotcha. it was a white elephant. Let's see, uh, a few other people saying thank you and this was a great talk. Um, here we got some questions over here. Let's see. Uh, hi, thank you, this was great. Do you know anything about how the pool house was used during their stay at Waldoon Manor? Well, I think that uh, wait a minute, the, the pool house at uh, the house on the ocean, I'm sure, was used um, by James Donahue Sr. for lots of parties uh, and uh, good times, yeah. And the pool was also uh, designed by John Russell Pope. And do you know of any uh, funny stories or anything about the pool house or from any of these parties, maybe? Um, uh, I know I don't have any anecdotes about about what went on in there. <laughs> gotcha. I'm sorry. And, if and, anybody knows any, shoot them my way. Yeah. 
Um, and they were also inquiring um, if an indoor pool was unusual at that time. Yes, it was very unusual. Um, and it, um, uh, everybody, it was destroyed in the hurricane and it turned into a million little shards of glass. I would say an indoor pool is still somewhat unusual. Uh, if I were to go, it was out. it was very unusual, and um, everybody took photographs, including my father, after the 1938 hurricane, and he made a little note that the insurance company paid sixty nine thousand dollars for it. Wow. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, this seems to be a good example of truth being stranger than fiction. Uh, what a sad, and pathetic family saga. It that it is. Um, and uh, sort of with that, somebody's asking if you can recommend any good uh, biography to read more about this sort of sad and pathetic family. <laughs> well, I, I have to give Gary Lawrence, uh, our Gilded Age uh, expert, uh, credit for recommending Dancing with the Devil, which has uh, the whole story of the Duke and Duchess and Jimmy and Jesse. Huh. And then we have someone, someone asking, uh, was the family involved with any charitable works? Oh, yes. I don't, I, I, I they, they were. I don't have um, any specifics on that, but I know they did do, do some charity work and money. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think think that about does it for all the questions for today's talk. Um, so I would recommend everybody, if you're interested, check out that book Mary mentioned, uh, Dancing with the Devil. Um, and then if you've missed any of our other previous talks about the High Style and the Gilded Age exhibit that we have going on, again, you can find them on our YouTube page. You can watch those uh, after this one. Um, and maybe if you want, you can come by the museum, set up an appointment, and come see the exhibit while you still can. Um, not sure exactly how much longer we'll have it up, but it's still there for the time being. So thank you again, everybody, and have a good day.